Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, gang. How are we all feeling today? Are you starting to think about the summer holidays, getting your beach body ready or your summer wardrobe and music playlist? Well, I got some bad news. School is not out for the summer just yet, kids. So I wanted to talk to you about an edtech company called Polyup. Now, Polyup recently launched and is the world's first casual modding digital platform. But it's designed for math teachers in particular. The visual self-paced environment allows for players to freely experiment with numbers and functions all through gamified computational challenges that must be correctly modified before the players can advance to a higher level. Now, the platform will soon scale to feature the ability to modify real-world objects using an in-app augmented reality feature. I mean, how cool is that? Maths was never that cool when I was at school. Speaking of which, confession time, maths is my Achilles heel. But maybe the founders at Polyup can help me overcome that irrational fear of numbers and patterns and keeping me awake and motivated more than anything. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way back to Silicon Valley so we can speak with the founders of Polyup, including Shia Zarkesh, who's just 18 years old but completely rocking the ad tech scene. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little bit more about who you are and also your roles at Polyup? I'm Shia. Uh, I'm currently a high school senior. Uh, I'm about to graduate, but I co-founded Polya back in sophomore year, 2015. And they say my role is like chief teenage officer, but that sounds like kind of a joke. So I, I prefer the title UX and communications. Yeah, uh, but that, you know, that sounds much better, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, it, it seems a little more legit that way, you know. Yeah. But you know, I'm, I'm basically a teenager on the team. Uh, so since our target market is people around my age, maybe you know a little bit younger. Um, I work closely with our development team to make sure what we make would be attractive and you know would be liked um, by young people. And so the other side of what I do is the communication side. I manage our social media, our email accounts, and essentially I'm the liaison between teachers um, and the company. So if any teachers are having trouble, have any questions about PolyUp, I talk to them and also build our teacher resources to really you know give the teachers a support network. Well, uh, on my side, uh, this is Amir, and I'm. Uh, the CEO of the company. I basically make things happen. Uh, I'm sure as that. And, uh, you know, I bring tea and coffee. Uh, my, my background is uh, from high tech. This is the seventh company uh, that I co-founded. And uh, I never had a experience like this before. Always was in high tech. And uh, you really don't see the impact of what you do. It is amazing here. You actually see the impact right away in the in the face and, and the reaction of their kids. So what I want to do is take you guys back in time to the moment where you had the idea for Polyup. I mean, what was the inspiration and also what motivated you to turn that idea into a reality that it is now? I don't think I can like respond fully to this question without talking about Yahya for a second. So Yahya, Yahya Tabesh, he was the third co-founder of Polyup and he spent his life in the field of math education. So he set up a bunch of math houses in Iran and managed their, you know, international math Olympiad team and essentially revitalized the math education system there. And he even won this prize called like the Eridosh Award. Um, it's this international award given every two years to people who have a huge impact in math education. So like, you know, this guy's legit. Anyway, so six or seven years ago, Yahya came over to the U.S. to be a visiting math education professor at Stanford. Um, so this is Stanford University. He began writing a problem-solving book to demonstrate some new age, you know, problem-solving techniques and make math really cool and interesting uh, with some fun problems. So this is when he and I met, and he told me about this book he was writing, and I was like, "Wow, that sounds super cool. I'm I'm a huge math nerd. I love this stuff." And then so he was like, "Well, how would you feel about helping me write it? I need someone to you know brush up my English, and and I'd love to I'd love to have another person help me out." And honestly, I was like, whoa, you want me to help you? <laughs> like, there's this God among math educators and asking me some, like, you know, some lonely high schooler to help him write a book. And that, that was super cool. So that's how we met. And, and we've actually grown very close since uh, we, we work very well together. So anyway, we, like, set off trying to make math as, as interactive and as visual as possible with this, with this book. And essentially, we had, like, 12 math problems, and we walked through how to solve them and, and a bunch of different ways to solve them. It was, it was very cool. 
Um, so we finished that book, and you can actually find it online now. It's called uh, Eureka. As we wrote, we realized that it was super hard to make math engaging and visual when the medium of interaction was just, you know, a book, a bunch of pages of text. Like when you're trying to relay pure in memorization or information, a, a book works great. But for what we were trying to do, which is super, you know, dynamic and a ton of different kinds of solutions and super experimental, reading text isn't really the best way to do it. And I guess this is kind of where the idea for Polya began. This is the inception. Um, Yahya got this dream of building a digital playground um, to instill these same computational thinking and problem solving skills that we're trying to do with this book. And it makes a lot of sense too. Like if you look at how far technology has advanced in the last decade, it's, it's pretty crazy, right? Like no one had a smartphone back then. And now everyone has a straight up computer in their pocket. Um, but still education is, is still the same, right? You have a teacher giving students worksheets and you know, solving sequential problems. Um, whereas you could totally take advantage of this digital medium to make, make problem solving especially way more interactive um, and way more effective. So I guess that's how Polyup started. And that's also when my dad and our fourth, fourth co-founder, Shaheen, came in to kind of bring the, the entrepreneurial side um, and actually make this a true company. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that's how Polyup was born. What a fantastic story. I mean, why do you think, though, that this computational thinking is both timely and a critical component in American education, equally education all around the world now? Yeah, um, I would say it's, it's important all around the world, not just in America. Yeah. I guess the first thing we, we should do here is, is really define computational thinking. Um, cause it's, it's a pretty vague term. It sounds a little bit like a buzzword and it can differ a little bit depending on who you ask. Um, so kind of the, the, again, the vague definition is computational thinking is super important to new topics becoming indispensable in today's age. Things like data science, things like cryptography, informatics, artificial intelligence. It's a way of approaching and analyzing computational thing, computational problems by honing the skills of pattern recognition, decomposition, abstraction, and algorithm design. So those four skills are essentially the core of computational thinking. In a sense, computational thinking is like critical thinking for STEM, while critical thinking focuses on finding relationships between ideas and written text. Computational thinking is devoted to finding patterns and designing solutions in numerical and, and mathematical contexts. Um, though it's super important to a lot of STEM fields like mathematics and computer science, it often goes unaddressed in schools. And I think, I think we can get into this a little more later. That's a huge. That's a huge reason why we're doing what we're doing. So students are always, a lot of the times, left without the ability to creatively solve new problems um, because so much of their education has been so um, repetitive and so, you know, uh, formula and procedure based. They don't have that creative side to things, and that's really what computational thinking is. It's very important as a basic of STEM, but also it's very, very critical to understand that in 21st century. Computational thinking is a basic skill that needs to be next to reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's, it's not just a subject. It really goes back to the basic skills. And it's, uh, it's, it's something that the, across the field, if you become a nurse, become a mechanic, or become an engineer, doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be really a STEM field. It's a, it's a, a skill that helps you to have the analytic thinking plus the number sense. And that's in this an age that we are bombarded with all kind of analysis and data is critical, independent of what is the uh, what's the subject, a specific subject that we work on. I think that that's what what calls for having the computer thinking become integral part of the basic education system. Absolutely. But just to help anyone understand exactly what it is and also what makes it unique, could you tell me how math teachers are using Polyup to actually supplement conceptual lessons and also how students are responding differently as well as they would as they would to traditional education? For sure, yeah. So I guess you can say teachers use Polyup in two ways. Yeah. Uh, so first, you have Polyup as, say, a general tool to engage students in mathematics and give them those basic fundamental computational thinking and problem-solving skills. Um, so we have a lot of, you know, fun puzzles, you know, number number games, things like that. And they're in a super interactive and super visual environment, which really lends itself well to getting students excited about mathematics. And this side of things is also why we're getting a ton of support from special ed and support classrooms. Um, because a lot of the job of those teachers is to really get students back into the mindset of mathematics and get them excited about it again. Now, the second way that teachers use Polyup um, is really as a supplement to specific topics that they cover in the classroom. So Polyup is super powerful 
for you know showing a demonstration of some mathematical concept visually. So for example, if you're sh talking about sequences in series, which is a very um, important topic in, uh, for middle and high schoolers, a lot of the times you can, you, can, you, know, you can write out sequences, you can write out series, but you can't really represent the concept of a sequence or a series, especially if it's an infinite sequence, right? You can't write that thing out. Um, whereas in Polya, you can really see the sequence or the series build, and you can see the formulas and algorithms that cause this sequence or series to be created. Um, so in that sense, it's a really cool um, demonstration of mathematical concepts in a visual uh, format. And I, I think I want to add one, one other point on this. One of the main challenges in, in the schools, like especially also in math classes, is the heterogeneity of the level of skills among the students. Some skills know, know much better, some of them know less. Sometimes this student get it faster, sometimes the other one. And the traditional way to run, run a classroom is not well suited to keep everybody engaged because some of them are behind and some of them are ahead. The, the scaffolding which is uh, behind the Polya platform allows various students, various learners, to discover their own knowledge at their own pace. And that enables actually the teacher to handle the classroom better, you know, focused on somebody that needs some help directly while the other one going faster and using the next level and next level and, and still remain engaged. So one more thing uh, as far as how students are responding um, to Polio. Um, I'm really glad you asked that because it's been overwhelmingly positive. We have a lot of teachers reach out to us on social media or through email telling us about just how amazing polyup is as a tool and how much their students love it right like they bring out polyup and we've actually taken polyup to a bunch of classes to you know test it and see what the reaction is ourselves and, and it's night and day right when we first come in they're kind of they're kind of bored and they're like oh who are these uh, yet another lecturer coming in to talk to us wow how boring um, but once they start playing with it they they really get like they get hooked and they, they see it as as a game at first um and they just keep going and, and really want to get as far as possible in what their minds is a game. But at the same time, they're, they're really learning truly important stuff. Um, so in that sense, it, it does a really good job and teachers are a huge fan um, of what Polyup can do for the classroom. I'm glad you said the teachers are a big fan there as well. I was going to ask, did you face any resistance from uh, the education authorities or teachers at all? Yeah, you, you know, the, the interesting part is you know, to bring the, the crux of the Yahya's idea to show the joy of math to the kids and teachers and make it such that it's not based on instruction, actually they like to do it, is not an easy thing to do and there was, there's not exact science behind it. It took us about two years to go to hundreds of classrooms in Bay Area and try four generations of prototype to come up with a... With a approach that actually achieves this. So we did have a lot of resistance in the first three generations or the two years that we tried it. And there were all sorts of different ways. I mean, for example, in the third generation, we, we tried what we called chocolate covered broccoli. Broccoli is mad, is good for you, but it's not tasty. You put chocolate on it, some game, and you make the kids play. You know, in the third generation, the kids get excited, the game was exciting, they were playing it, and as soon as they bite to the broccoli, they throw it away, oh, this is another match. And, and what happened in the fourth generation, we went back to the original idea that Yahya had, and that the math by itself intrinsically is joyful if you discover it yourself. And that's the reason this fourth generation actually has the faces mad, the game is mad, but actually the kids and the teachers get uh, get engaged uh, both. And we didn't have this earlier. I mean, this really happened this time. After the first time we brought it out in December, we got inundated with teachers' uh, inputs. So much that it took us four months to really react to all the inputs and bring the version which actually last week got released nationally on polyup.com. And that's what now, now it has reflecting what math teachers did. And it is really, you can say right, right now, it, it's a platform that is started by a math teacher and a student and is really not expanded by math teachers and students themselves. So can you also tell me about the Polyup user experience and how Poly machines actually support casual modding? Because that's kind of incredibly cool too. Yeah, fantastic. I, I'm glad you're asking that. 
you know, modding or modifying the world around you is fun. And, 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 you know, it's very rewarding because if when you mod things, then you become owner of those, those, those uh, environments and objects around you. But, you know, it's very hard to mod. You need to know coding. You need to have system understanding. And worse, if you mod one thing, modding this, another thing it would be completely different. There's not uniformity among them. And, and to make this modding, which is so rewarding, become casual, you have to really address these challenges. You need a powerful universal language that has the capability of mod various environments. And that's where math comes in. Math is the most powerful uh, compact language to be able to describe behavior of different systems. And, and the nice thing about it is every grade, every class, every school has a math teacher every year, like an hour a day. And they're getting, you know, familiar with that. The issue is they're not connected to real life. And, you know, as soon as the math gets connected to real life and, and we see that with that math, which is what's abstract, you can actually change things, now the whole thing gets changed. Now math becomes something I want to learn, not because the school says so, because I want to mod things around me. So that, that's what we have achieved in, in the poly of interface that both use the math language, which is universal, and it provides a universal interface that you can with that pair with a robot, you know, to pair with a uh, with a toy, or even even pair with a physical environment like a classroom, and start to have a modification to that. Yeah, and I just want to echo how important um, connecting math to the real world is. I know, at least um, like as a high schooler, um, all my or most of my friends and most of the people my age. Are really are really not fans of math, right? They think it's it's kind of useless, and they think uh, that even if it's useful, like it's not useful for them in their lives. And that's purely because the type of math that we teach in classrooms is is limited to the numbers that we have in the classroom. It's never applied to anything um, in the real world. You never see the impact of math on the real world. I know there's there's a joke that people give like, when am I ever going to use the Pythagorean theorem in real life? <laughs> but I mean, if you if you actually like show the the impact of the Pythagorean theorem um, in a real life model, or you know, trying to build, uh, for example, an architectural design um, using the Pythagorean theorem, then it becomes useful. Then you actually see when when it matters, uh, and that's kind of what we're trying to do with with casual modding. Now, another incredibly cool aspect that I was reading about is there's a potential future functionality of Polyup to mod the real world versus augmented reality features all within the app too. Can you tell me about that? Sure. You see, uh, the being able to mod various toys and robots is very cool. Yeah. But there is one challenge. The challenge is not even in Silicon Valley, every student has a robot in their pocket. Still, you have to have the cost of buying those, setting them up, they have to have battery, they have to have connectivity. All those should get set up, even when you have casual modding, which is very simple. So there is an equity issue here. There is a gap that we need to address it if you want to have a, a mass usage and mass uh, learning of the computational thinking with this kind of modding. And, and the way that we found out we can address that is through using augmented reality. A lot of augmented reality technologies are coming out this year. You know, phones in, in any platform from iOS to Android are enabling various packages for that. And we already have built some prototypes showing that the same way that you can mod a real life robot, you can actually mod an augmented reality robot. With the difference that for the second one, the only thing you need is the phone in your pocket. And that that become a point of engagement. You have shown this there, this prototype to various classes. You have to see the face of the kids. I mean, this is not a classroom anymore. It's like a park that the kids coming together and they can change things around them. You know, that that's one important one. It brings the equity. There is another aspect. There are things around us that physically are not programmable, are not uh, amenable to change. You are in a classroom. The classroom has walls which are fixed. But as soon as in a classroom you have barcodes on the wall and you can scan them into polyop and start to mod them with augmented reality, 
you open an infinite amount of possibility about about modding your environment also. So, so solving the issue of equity and solving the issue of the fixed environment are both uh, reasons why augmented reality is going to be play a, a critical role in the upcoming versions of Polya. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I love the fact that just when you see a child become curious and from when they go to scan something and they see how it enters a machine and wants to know how it works, something like that is incredibly special, isn't it? Yeah, man, it's, it's, it's so joyful, unbelievable. So if there is a teacher or parent listening today that is really interested in getting involved, I mean, where do they begin? What countries do you serve? And also, do you have a ballpark pricing model that you could share with anyone listening? For sure. So getting involved is actually super easy. Uh, all you have to do is go to polyup.com um, and press play. That's it. No pricing, no nothing. It's completely free and it will always be free for students and teachers. Um, and, and the reason we really want to do this is because Polya wants to have a social impact. We want to, you know, be available to as many people as possible, and we don't want to hinder people from using this awesome product. We don't worry; we're going to make money through through the big companies, through the casual modding. Um, but as far as students, parents, and teachers, that's all going to be free. So again, just go to polyup.com and press play. Uh, that's it. And and I want to emphasize that the, the Polya really is a movement. So, so it's, it's very important to have engagement of everybody to make the platform better. We, we have, as I said, inundated with the teachers coming in. We start to see uh, parents' interest coming in with, with a lot of inputs. And, and the more the community start to provide their inputs into this, this is grow, um, grow much more. And I want to emphasize the activities, which we call poly machines, are actually can be added by the teachers, parents, and students. So the content on the platform is not fixed. It's covering from third grade to 12th grade. It goes across various subjects from order of operations to pre-algebra, algebra, algebra, and even calculus. And every student or every teacher or every parent can add their own machine to the platform and share it with their, their local, the neighbors, or even to the world. Now, another question I feel I must ask you, because it often concerns me that traditional education has this almost impossible task of arming kids with skills for jobs that don't even exist yet. I mean, do you see that as a real challenge too? And is is that another reason why Polyup is thinking about doing things a little bit differently? Oh, definitely. I mean, I, I'm glad you're asking this, because you see, the need for computational thinking is something that is now well established. And the way that people doing it is by bringing coding to school. There are, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars every year gets spent from every side, from, from the public side, from a lot of companies to bring coding to every age. They won't even bring it to the first grade. And the reason they're saying that that's important is because, again, they want to bring the logical thinking and number sense, the basic of the uh, computational thinking to the schools. The problem is that most of the people that go through the schools, they're actually in real life, they're not going to code. And we put the, we're trying to put the, the kids under a lot of stress of learning a new language, go through those syntax, start to, to, to play with it such that at the end they gather and understand some computational thinking. When, when we talked about it's hard and with the vision that Yahya had, we come to conclusion that you actually there are ways to teach this or to learn computational thinking back to the standard good old math classes. Again, every grade, every school has one math teacher already. Is the existing infrastructure which is very solid, and instead of pushing to have new class for coding, you actually can make the students with the joy of math learn computational thinking while they're learning their standard subject in math. And then those that they want to continue, they will go and learn the coding, which is important. So I think this is, this is what, what void and gap we have seen to how to have a more mass learning of computational thinking without the push of coding where, when it's not necessary. So speaking of the future, I mean, how do you see Polyup evolving and adapting to meet with any of those changes ahead? Well, I mean, to be frank, uh, Polyup now is, is, has, is its own entity because the teachers start to get the ownership of it. Yeah. So this week we are at NCTM 
which is the national uh, annual gathering of the math teachers in US. More About 10,000 math teachers are, are coming around here. There are large meetings happening between math teachers and they're kind of getting hold of the platform themselves and pushing it forward. So I think our role really, uh, really is, is supporting them and be enabler by bringing the, 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 the casual modding technology and then the AR to it. But as far as where the platform goes and the content goes, because content get generated by the teachers themselves, really they are driving it. Is the community on Palio is driving it? Well, a huge thank you for coming on today. But before I let both of you go, could I just ask that you remind the listeners one more time of your web details, how they can get the app, and also any contact details of how they can reach a member of your team? Yeah, for sure. Um, so again, the website is polyup.com. That's P-O-L-Y-U-P.com. And if you just go to the website, press play, it's free. It's always going to be free. Um, and anyone around the world can play it. So it's super easy to get get involved. Um, and if you guys want to contact us at any time, we have our support email, which is poly, so P-O-L-Y, at polyup.com. Or you can contact me or Amir directly at shaya at polyup.com or amir at polyup.com. Um, we'd love to hear what you think. Now, one of the things that I've loved listening to you guys talk about today is hearing about the, the face of the kids as they're understanding and learning about this stuff and also opening up their curious side and seeing that traditional classroom suddenly come to life. And I think that on its own is a priceless thing. And I always say at the end of every show that tech works best when it brings people together. But if you can actually get kids to actually embrace maths in a world where they think it's not important, again, is a fantastic thing. So thanks for coming on today. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a great story. You know how most people say school days are your best days? I've always disagreed with that statement, but maybe it was because of it was a boring classroom and that strict one-size-fits-all approach to learning, which never really fit my mindset, because I've always been a bit of a dreamer that's been easily distracted. But Polyup seems to be transforming the traditional classroom. And anything that engages with kids help celebrate that curious side and encourage them to question how stuff works and brings the classroom to life is all good by me. If anything, I'm just jealous it wasn't around when I was that easily distracted kid staring out the window. But hey, I found my way in the end. But I'd love to hear your thoughts, your experiences, insights, etc. about Polyup and indeed any EdTech solution. And also how things such as Polyup could actually encourage kids to embrace maths which is going to be so important in an age ruled by AI, machine learning and data science. Remember, Dr. Neil's door is always open, so you can email me at techblogwriter at outlook.com or tweet me at Neil C. Hughes. But hey, that's it for today's episode, so class dismissed. Just remember to join me again tomorrow for another great guest. But until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.